Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know who wrote First Thessalonians? It's very important to keep that in mind as we go through a lot of scripture today. Paul wrote that. Paul had an idea of when the righteous dead would be resurrected. Let me rephrase that so it's more clear to you. Did Paul have the right conception of what would happen when Jesus would come back yes. and the righteous day would be resurrected? Hey, you're not yes. shaking as if they were on the same page. Now that's important to remember because Paul is the same one that wrote most of these hard verses about the state of the dead. So if Paul has a clear understanding, then when you get to these harder verses, you have to go back to the clearer ones and realize that Paul wasn't contradicting himself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So last week we looked at the story of Jesus raising Lazarus. And um, this week I want to look at a lot of texts concerning the state of the dead and what happens. The first text I want to look at is Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7. And ask you a question. What happens when you die? What happens at death? Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Ricky, do you have that? When you, when you get it, can you read it for me? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, that's in the Old Testament, verse 7. And you're going to read that with the question in mind, what happens to you at death? Chapter 12 and 7. Yep, chapter 12, verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Okay, so do you remember last week we looked at Genesis when God created Adam and how he did it? What did God do? It says that God formed man out of the dust of the ground, correct? And breathed into his nostrils what? The breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living being. Okay? So, at death, what happens? Man turns back into dust, and the spirit goes back to God. Is that correct? The question is, is what is the spirit that goes back to God? Because most churches teach that that spirit is you without your body. But it is a conscious thing that goes back to God, um, I guess, to determine whether you stay there or go down to hell. But let's look at what this spirit is that returns to God. Again, real quick, turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. That's the text that's going to tell you that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. You guys have that? Catherine, you got that? Can you read that for me? Mm -hmm. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So for man to become alive, what did it take? It took God to form his body, but before God breathed into him, he was still just dust. He was not alive, had no consciousness, right? But it says God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then he became alive. How did that happen? It's because God is the author of life, and God is life. And so for you and I to live and breathe, that is a gift that daily comes from God. And so at death, that spark of life, that God breathed into Adam's nostrils goes back to God. Okay? Now, turn with me to, let's look at James chapter 2, verse 26. James is going to be towards the end of the New Testament. James chapter 2, verse 26.
Do you have that again with you? Yeah. You want to read that for me? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So the body without the spirit is what? Dead. dead. Okay? So I wanted to bring you to this text to let you see that again, for life to happen, it takes the body and also the spirit, the breath of God. But again, is that breath of God another version of you? And at death, does is that what goes back to heaven? And that's what we want to look at today. So, turn to Job in the Old Testament. Can you find that? Job is going to be before the book of Psalms. So if you can find Psalms, go to Job. And let's look at chapter 27, verse 3. Get a little bit of context here. So I'm going to start with chapter 27, verse 1. Moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God is in my nostrils. I want you to think about that. What did God breathe into Adam? And so Adam became alive, right? What is Job telling us here? That as long as he has breath, he's alive. Where does that breath come from? And that life comes from God. And that is the breath of God in his nostrils that spark life. So if you take these texts and you realize that at death, the spirit goes back to God. That spirit is the breath of God. And that is when you're reading these verses and you're looking at the word spirit, and you take your concordance and you can look it up yourself. Spirit and breath, the same thing. Okay? So when God made Adam alive, he breathed into him the breath of life, and Adam became alive. And at his death, that breath went back to God. Why? Because that's who it belonged to. Now, is that spirit immortal? Is that spirit what gives you immortality? The answer to that is we'll continue to look in Scripture and let the Bible tell us. Okay, so that was Job. Let's look at Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Your fingers are going to get cramps by the time today. <laughs> Genesis chapter 7. Verses 21 and 22. This is the story of the flood. This is the story of what happened at the flood. Verse 21 says, And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. Verse 22, All in whose nostrils was what? The breath of the Spirit. Can you see that what God breathed into Adam is the same thing that was spoken of here in this text, spoken of in Job? It is what gives us life. And that when we die, that goes back to God. And what that is, is just that, the breath of life. It is not you in a spiritual form. Okay? And we'll continue to look at this as well. The Bible uses the word soul. Again, if you take the King James and you read that when God breathed into Adam, the breath of life, man became a living what? Soul. Okay? The question is, is do souls die? Okay? What does... Ezekiel tell us about that. Well, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. Uh, this is a very familiar verse to a lot of you. 
Ezekiel is still in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. Catherine, do you have that? Can you read that for me? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So when you read this verse, what is it talking about? It's talking about sin. It's talking about what the wages of sin are, because Paul said the wages of sin is what? So it's telling you that the soul that sins shall what? Die. Shall die. So do souls die? Yeah. Answer is yes. So if you had an immortal soul, it couldn't die, and that's contradicting what the scripture says, right? So you have to keep these texts in mind as you start to read the five or six texts that are a little hard to understand when it comes to the state of the dead and the immortality of the soul. Okay? Now, there's a verse in 1 Timothy that tells you who only has immortality. You know who that is? Okay, God. God. Is Jesus God? Yeah. Okay. Paul tells us plainly in his writings that we look forward to getting immortality, to receiving immortality. That this mortal shall put on immortality. So, if the soul that sins will die, and if we look forward to receiving immortality, then that's telling me that right now there's nothing in me that's immortal right now. Right? Okay. So, turn to Revelation 16, verse 3. It's at the very uh, last book of the Bible. Revelation 16. Do you remember last week how many texts I told you were in Scripture about the state of the dead? How many? Over 2,400 texts that speak on the state of the dead. Okay? 2,400. Alright, so Revelation chapter 16, verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his vial on the sea, and it became blood as a dead man. And every, what? Every living creature. Now, some older versions say every living soul. Die. Okay? So I want you to see how these words are interchangeable. Especially when it comes to the word soul, because I was raised from a Catholic background. And the Catholic Church taught that you had an immortal soul. And that that soul, at death, went for judgment day before God. And, well, actually, let me back up. You went, to, you went to a waiting place first. It's called purgatory. If you weren't able to get all the way to God, you went to purgatory, and hopefully your relatives could get you out of there. And if you were bad, you went to hell. Okay? But what they taught is that you had an immortal soul, that at death it went somewhere, and that was you. That was your essence. That was your consciousness. You knew what was going on. Okay? I took you through this last week that in the Garden of Eden, and this is where you got to start from, in the Garden of Eden, when Eve confronted the serpent, and they had this interchange between them, the serpent said, you will not, what? Die. You will not die. But God told her, you will, what? Die. die. Who told the truth? And who lied? We know God doesn't lie. So God told the truth. That if you sin, you will die. Satan said, no, you won't die. Not only will you not die, but you will be like God. And unfortunately, the churches still teach that today. Why is this important? We'll get to that in a little bit. I told you a little bit about that last week, and that is... As we get closer and closer to the end of time, the demonic manifestations that are going to appear on this earth 
are going to be so overwhelming that if it were possible, it would deceive who? Right. The very elect. One of the greatest um, manifestations of demonic power will be about the state of the dead. And people who have died appearing here and there and talking and saying things that contradict scripture. And if you don't know the truth of this, you will be deceived because your eyes and your senses will be telling you one thing, but the Word of God will be telling you something else. Who do you trust? Okay, so, is man immortal? Turn back to Job, chapter 4. You were already there, so you should know where it's at. Your finger's getting tired yet? Because I'm not even a quarter of the way through. Um, again, Job is right before the book of Psalms. Job, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 17, Job asks a question. And what is his question? Can a mortal, who's a mortal? That's me and you, we're mortal. What does that word mortal mean? It means that we're subject to death, right? Okay. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? So, are humans immortal? What does Job say? Can a mortal man be more just than God? So he's telling you there that we are mortal. It's not hard to figure out because if you live long enough or if you walk in front of a car, you're going to find just how mortal you are. Right? Okay, so that question is answered because I wanted to go to that question he asked you this next one. Who alone is immortal? And you find that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses, mm, let's go 15 and 16. So 1 Timothy chapter 6. Carl, when you get that, can you read that for me? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Uh, 15 16. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Is that text clear? Who alone has immortality? It's God. Those who make up the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, alone have immortality. So the question is, is where did this doctrine of the immortality of the soul come from? Satan? That's a really good answer. It's true. How did it get into the church? Do you realize that there is one thing that pagan religions have in common, all of them, and that is the teaching of the immortality of the soul. If that's found in paganism, why is it being taught in Christianity? And that's a question that you need to ask yourself. So where did this doctrine come from? Again, the book of Great Controversy tells you that it was borrowed from paganism, and then during the Dark Ages, the church at that time incorporated it into her doctrine. And in the Protestant Reformation, they continued to keep that doctrine. This is one of the reasons why God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church to bring clarity on this issue. Why? Because of the importance of not being deceived. Amen. Now listen, if you believe that when you die, you go straight to heaven, and one of your loved ones, who you were so close with, 
passed away. And in your pain and in your suffering, they appear to you. Are you going to listen to what they say? John, listen to the question. If you believe that when you die, you go either straight to heaven, because nobody preaches anybody going to hell. <laughs> you believe that when you die, you go to eternal bliss and you're in the presence of God. If that person appears to you, are you going to listen to them? Yes. The answer is of course. Do you see how deceptive and scary and dangerous this teaching can become? Because if paganism believes this, and they are being told things that, you know, don't follow what Scripture says, and then those that are of the Christian faith are hearing the same things. Have you ever thought, how is Satan going to unite all the world's religions together? you got to believe it's not going to be on their things they disagree on. Right? How will he unite them? On the things that they do have in common and agree on. Now what's the main thing they agree on? Stay to the dead. And another thing that goes hand in hand with that is Sunday sacredness. There's a reason why God raised this church up. There's a reason why we have a distinct message to give, to proclaim, to prepare our people to meet Jesus Christ. And there's a reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet, because we haven't proclaimed that message in all its power and fullness, because we haven't submitted fully to the Spirit of God. So let's continue on in looking at these verses. So we looked at 1 Timothy, we asked the question, who alone is immortal? 1 Timothy told us that only God himself has immortality. Why? Because God is life. Everything that lives, everything that breathes, got that life from him. And without him, there would be no life. So at death, why do human beings die now? Because of the decision that Adam and Eve made. Because we are born with a sinful nature, and we fall to that sin, the wages of sin is what? Yeah. But praise God that the death you and I have seen and will die is only called the first death. And Jesus referred to that as a sleep. And that even though we have sinned and we deserve eternal death, eternal separation from God, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not what? Perish, Perish but have everlasting. everlasting life. So who does the everlasting life come from? It comes from Jesus Christ. Is there a condition set on that everlasting life? Yes. And the answer is yes. The condition is Jesus Christ. And you have to have him. You have to have a personal relationship with him. A lot of the world says they believe and accept Jesus. But Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. And unfortunately, a lot of times their fruits don't match their confession. Okay, so let's look at John chapter 5, verses 24 through 29, and ask this question. When we die, if we're in Christ, do we go to heaven at death? John chapter 5, that's an easy one to find. John chapter 5, verses 24 through 29. How many of you have the red letter edition? Is, are these verses in red? Yes. So who's speaking? Jesus. You think Jesus should know the true nature of what happens to you at death? Okay. Do you realize that, let's see if I can actually phrase this. Jesus tasted death for all of us. Is that right? Yes. Amen. Jesus is the only one who really knows what it means to really die. Not sleep, but die. What death did Jesus die? The first or the second? Do you understand this? 
that as believers in Christ, and if you're saved in Him, you will never taste death. Jesus made that plain. You may sleep. That's not the death that the Bible talks about. The death, that, that eternal death, the eternal separation from God, hell, that's the death that Jesus died for you and I. So you realize throughout all eternity, the only one who will ever have the experience of death is Jesus himself. And he'll carry those scars throughout all eternity. And we'll look at them and we will make up our minds to never disobey God again out of our own free will. Okay, so John chapter 5, verses 24 through 29. Patty, do you have that? Patty Dove? Patty Dove? Can you read that for me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when they death shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, into which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now Jesus said right there, if you believe on him, you have everlasting life. So see, you have everlasting life, so that means you don't die. Is that what he's talking about? <laughs> now you need to realize that how does God view our world? Is He constrained by time? Is He constrained by space? When Jesus made this uh, comment, was He making it in the constraints of time and space? When God looks at you in this life, this life isn't the life that's most important, is it? This is why God allows suffering, right? Because it's getting you to the place where you've accepted Christ and now you can go to the life that is everlasting. So that's the life that God is most concerned with. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So when Jesus makes a comment like this, Jesus is looking forward, right? Forward. And what he's saying is true. You as Christians and myself, I have everlasting life. This is why I don't have to fear death. This is why Paul was able to say, even at this time I'm being poured out like a drink offering. But I know that there's a crown laid up for me and that on that day, and this is how Christians throughout all the ages have been able to face death. Because we know that you may kill this body, but Jesus is able to bring it back. Amen? Does that make sense to you guys? Because he goes on to say, remember the question in mind was, when we die, do we go straight to heaven? And we're going to look at another text that you have to keep this text in mind. And it's a text in the book of Acts that talks about the patriarch David. Okay? But Jesus said, do not marvel for the hour is coming when those who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. Now, let me ask you a question. I asked you this last week. We looked at Jesus raising Lazarus from the grave. Why did he call him specifically by name? Because he had to. Because he only wanted to raise Lazarus. Okay? Okay, so, um, turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 29, okay, you're really close, you're really close, really close, so next book over, Acts chapter 2, verse 29, Patty Couch, do you have that one? 
Yes. Can you read that one? <coughs> Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you and make your expectations that he is both dead and buried. Stop. So, the speaker, do you know who's speaking here? You know who's speaking here? Peter. Chapter Peter. Peter. What chapter are you in? Two. Acts oh, chapter two. Acts chapter two, two verse. Four, it's it's Peter. It's Peter speaking. Peter says, "Men and brethren, let me speak freely." He's telling them, "I'm going to tell you the truth, and 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 I'm not going to sugarcoat this, but I want you."